We've lost a lot of things in 2020, haven't we? Be they temporary, like certain establishments closing in the midst of a global pandemic, or more permanent things like beloved and respected pop culture icons passing all too suddenly. Or maybe you have to come to terms with the creator of one of the most formative sagas of your childhood making a complete ass of herself and using her platform to perpetuate harmful myths about a marginalized community. Seriously, Rowling, what the f- Despite everything that Joanne Cloanne the Roland has done to discredit herself in the past few months, there is a reason Harry Potter managed to resonate with so many kids back when the books and movies were first coming out. Myself included. One need only look at the premise to see it. A seemingly ordinary teen is plucked from adversity and thrown into a secret, magical society where every mythological beast and fable is real. The boy is taken under the wing of an eccentric mentor and gets to learn magic at an absolutely awesome school filled with plenty of mystery and misadventures to make education actually interesting. Even though this is still a private boarding school, so it's got plenty of private school BS. He'll be serving detention with Hagrid tonight. He's got a little job to do. Inside the dark forest. Yeah, kids were caught wandering around after dark in the school hallways. That's 50 million points taken from your house. And also, you gotta go into this forest where there's a bunch of human hating centaurs and giant f***ing spiders. Because this is p appropriate punishment for you 11-year-old bastards. This doesn't even sound like Filch, what am I doing? <laughs> a lot of kids, especially in the early years of the franchise, could latch on to the fantasy of going to a magical school like that. Imagining themselves as Harry and going on all his adventures with true friendship and love and all that schmaltz that we pretend to hate but we secretly love. Come to find out later that the kid we've all been imagining ourselves as is actually the chosen one. Destined to defeat Wizard Hitler. No, not him, he's actually trying to stop the real Hitler? And save both the wizard and non-magical world from his tyranny. Well, that just about sweetens the deal for some kids. Who doesn't want to feel like they're destined for some greater purpose in this world? To be adored and practically worshipped by your peers. And at the end of it all, once you've saved the world and gone on your magical adventures, you get to grow up and be a cop. I joke, but even if you never liked the series, you can probably see the appeal. And whether or not it was any good to begin with, it came around when it was most needed, I think. Where many a young millennial and Gen Zer could empathize with Harry's neglected roots and growing up in uncertain times of political strife. It's part of the reason why Harry Potter still resonates with so many people, and why it seems like so many Potterheads still can't read another goddamn book. But why be coy about it? J.K. Rowling is a huge trans er, I mean, she's gender critical. Is that what he calls it? And that makes revisiting her work a bit... iffy. It's not as though Harry Potter was perfect before, but a lot of Rowling's gender-critical ideas have tainted the well for a lot of fans, especially those in the LGBT community. Emphasis on the T, Joe. With a lot of us turning our back on Rowling and Potter, what could ever hope to fill the void of that magical world with relevant themes of found family and love that we adored so much as children? Well, while 2020 may have taken a lot, it did give us at least one good thing. The Owl House is an animated TV show on Disney Channel that tells the story of a seemingly ordinary girl who is plucked from adversity and thrown into a magical realm where every mythological beast and fable is real. The girl is taken under the wing of an eccentric mentor and gets to learn magic at an absolutely awesome school filled with plenty of mystery and misadventures to make education actually interesting. Even though this is still a private boarding school and has a lot of private school BS. According to the rules, a good witch needs to hocus focus. You can only pick one of the nine tracks. Wait, this sounds familiar. I'm not trying to compare the Owl House to Harry Potter because I think that'd be a no contest situation. The Owl House is kind of better. She caught the rusty smidge. The what? Yeah, while you were celebrating your victory, I caught this guy. It means we automatically win. All magic sports are like this. That just invalidates all our efforts. If catching that thing is so important, why do anything else? There's no reason to watch any of the other players. That's such a stupid rule. But look, let's leave behind the Harry Potter angle and get down to brass tacks. The Owl House is a really fun show that kind of blew me away with how good it was. Ever since the first promo image dropped all the way back in early 2018, I knew it was the kind of show I'd be interested in at the very least. But fast forward over two years later and I can say with confidence that this is one of the best shows on Disney Channel to date. 
The premise is admittedly the same as a lot of other fantasy stories featuring a mundane protagonist thrust into a world of magic, but it's what they do with the tropes associated with these plots and characters that make it stand out. Season 1 ended only just, insert time here, and since we're a ways from Season 2's release, I thought I'd jump on the bandwagon of older millennials talking about cartoon shows made for kids and talk about why the Owl House is great in, insert time here. I'm gonna try to avoid the really heavy plot important spoilers, but I recommend you just watch the show yourself if you want to be completely blind. Trust me, it's great. But if you do need some convincing, I guess I can come up with an arbitrary list of all the good qualities the Owl House has. Starting with, number one, everything. Nah, screw it, list formats have been done. There's an archetypal main character that a lot of coming-of-age stories use in order to make their protagonist more relatable to both their target and older audiences. Mainly the eccentric oddball who doesn't fit in with their peers either by their own unconventional behaviors or just social awkwardness. Somebody sat on me again. Really? Oops! <laughs> Sorry, Penelope! You were banished because you were clumsy. Uh... The main character of the Owl House is no exception. This is Luz Noceta, an unconventional teen with an overactive imagination who just wants to- I like editing anime clips to music and, and reading fantasy books with convoluted backstories. At first glance, she's not entirely dissimilar to past Disney Channel protagonists in fantasy shows, being seen as something of a weirdo whose parents want to rein in. Hell, this is also the plot of nearly every Disney movie in the 90s. Hold this. We'll need more luck than I thought. After finding herself lured into a portal by a strange owl stealing her trash, she finds immediate kinship with the first person she meets, Edelyn Clawthorn the Owl Lady. Self-proclaimed greatest witch on the Boiling Isles, number one most wanted criminal, and seller of various human paraphernalia. Now, who wants to touch an outdated human reference? She lives on the outskirts of the town of Bonesboro in the titular Owl House alongside- The King of Demons! Who is basically what you get when you mix Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls with a Cubone from Pokemon. You mean this little bundle of joy? And Hootie, the- thing the, the uh, two demon thing that lives in the house or is the house or what 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 he's hooty the first episode does its job in introducing us to all these characters and giving us a general idea for the tone and outlook of the show a mostly comedic affair with subtle hints of horror and relevant themes of expressing yourself and not letting society dictate who you are disney channel follow your dreams do they even still do that slogan? I don't watch Disney Channel on TV anymore. It's a fine beginning, albeit one with elements I'd kinda seen before in other shows, like the first episode of Star vs. the Forces of Evil, or even in Gravity Falls. But hey, just because something reminds you of another thing, that doesn't make it bad, right? Everyone takes elements of things they like from other stories and puts it in their own. Creativity is just one big thread that splits into countless other threads. What really matters is what you do with these familiar elements and how you mold them to create something unique. I was optimistic after the first episode that this show had plenty of different threads to take with the plot and its characters. But let me tell you, I didn't expect things to get so unique as early as episode frickin' 2. I'm not gonna give a complete rundown of every episode, that would defeat the purpose of recommending the show. But when I say that they didn't wait long to give their own spin on familiar and frankly overused tropes, I mean they came out the gate frickin' swinging. Episode 1 ended with Luz deciding to stay behind and learn magic from Ida, only to immediately find she's more interested in having Luz be her delivery person than apprentice. Remember, never befriend a man in sandals and always measure twice, cut once. Uh... Good luck! This doesn't deter Luz from thinking that her being the only human on the Boiling Isles is part of some predetermined destiny a la her favorite fantasy series. Sure enough, she and King meet a wizard who tells Luz that she really is a chosen one, and sends her out on a quest to gain her own staff. As she's going along this quest, meeting all kinds of interesting and... exciting people, Ida is close on her trail, suspicious of the wizard's motives. And this is where I implore anyone who hasn't seen the show yet to skip ahead to this timestamp, as the twist of this episode is both really clever and really creepy. 
see, the main reason Luz buys into the wizard telling her she's the chosen one is brought about after Ida and King paint a rather grim portrait of life on the Boiling Isles. How no one is special, how everyone is just out for themselves, and this clashes with Luz's wide-eyed curiosity and excitement at the world she's literally wandered into. Her optimism seems to pay off the more she goes along in her quest, but Ida and King are quick to discover this wizard isn't all he says he is. And this reveal, you guys, this freaking reveal after Luz finds the staff. It was obvious this was where the episode was going, they wore it right on their sleeves. But when we find out what the wizard actually looks like, it still shook me. Your hubris has failed you, witch apprentice! <laughs> Like, damn! The fact that we knew the quest was bull for most of the episode already gave it a creepy vibe, but they went even harder with this creature design. On top of that, a creepy guy hiding behind various identities like a kind old man or hot and troubled teenager in order to lull a real teenager into a false sense of security, only to exploit them for their own wants is never not gonna be creepy in any context. And you lured her right into my trap, all because you wanted to think you were special! Of course Luz is able to fight through the puppeteer's illusions and save her friends, but it does put a damper on her outlook on staying in the Isles if Ida and King were right about how uncaring and nihilistic it really is. To her credit, Ida tells Luz some pretty good advice that's a compromise between harsh reality and unfanged optimism. Look kid, everyone wants to believe they're chosen. But if we all waited around for a prophecy to make us special, we'd die waiting. And that's why you need to choose yourself. And that was when I knew this show was gonna be something pretty great. In the last couple years, I've noticed a bit of a pushback when you praise something for subverting expectations. But I feel that's the best way to describe some of the episodes and character arcs throughout season one of The Owl House. Some of these twists are more obvious than others, but where I was most surprised in terms of my own expectations was in the sheer amount of character development nearly every major character gets on this show. As the season goes, we're introduced to the magical school of Hexside, where many young witches are taught all the fundamentals of magic, learning under specific tracks that match up to the nine covens that make for the most profitable careers on the Isles. It's here where we meet some of the characters around Luz's age. These include Willow, a young witch picked on by many of her fellow students at the school, her friend Gus, who... You know, I was trying to remember what character development Gus goes through, but he only has one major episode dedicated to him. I wonder why that is. Finally, I'm not to become my best self. You're always your best self. <laughs> Fair enough. And then there's... I saw that! We'll come back to her. Even if certain characters aren't really explored in depth, nearly everybody on this show changes in some way, mostly through Luz's goodwill and cheerful energy, even when that same energy and willingness to help others often lands her in her own trouble. But she always owns up to her mistakes, and the lessons she and her friends learn do seem to stick, remarkably enough. The kind of shows I used to watch as a kid were much more serialized affairs where there'd be a conflict brought about by a character's sense of wand overtaking their needs, and a lesson would be learned only to promptly be forgotten about in the next episode. There's nothing really wrong with shows like that, they lend well to the more comedic style most of them had. But when you think about shows like Spongebob Squarepants or Fairly Odd Parents, is character development really the first thing that comes to your mind? You said we were mediocre! That's it! He made us feel special! It seems there's been a lot more emphasis on overarching stories in animated shows in the past decade, though. And this is the kind of format that encourages big shakeups and character growth you don't normally find in animated shows from the 90s or 2000s. And before any of you start typing about how there were plenty of shows back then that had narratives, believe me, I know. But they rarely had narratives spanning the entire season or even the entire show. Stuff like Avatar The Last Airbender, which had a focus goal established midway in the first season, was the exception to the rule and not the standard. While I wouldn't say it's the standard for every current animated show to have overarching plots, we've definitely seen more of it in the past few years, and I personally think that's a great thing. While a show like The Owl House would probably work in an episodic format, I find it much more interesting to see how these characters grow and react to the world changing around them. Luz herself is a pretty big change, not only in that she's the only human on the Boiling Isles, but also in how she shakes up the status quo for pretty much everybody. Without her, Ida would just be running scams while King boasts of his own self-importance. 
neither of them really starting to learn to care for other people outside themselves without her infectious, selfless attitude. And Willow would be stuck learning a magical track that she just doesn't mesh with. And then you have- NOT SO FAST! Yeah. Let's talk about Amity now. A lot of good videos have already come out on why Amity Blight is such an interesting character in deconstruction of the bully archetype, so I won't talk over any of those. Still, I'd be doing a disservice to a video called The Owl House is Great and Here's Why if I didn't talk about her in any capacity. The first we see of Amity, she presents herself as a haughty, condescending classmate of Willow's who boasts of her own magical prowess while putting Willow's down. I mean, she literally rolls in on a high horse... Okay, pot, as her introduction. You can't be any bigger of a jerk if you were trying. The rest of her appearances in her debut episode are her trying to expose Luz after she poses as Willow's abomination so she can get a high grade in class. This plan ends up working out better than either of them could have realized, with the teacher even giving Willow Amity's gold star for top studentry. She doesn't take this kindly, going so far as nearly letting Luz get dissected by the principal just to prove a point. Not a very good first impression. But in the words of Mr. Lemony Snicket, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but first impressions are often entirely wrong. Yeah, how'd you like that? Other people usually cite scientists and reputable sources in their videos, and I cite a fictional biographer. Anyway, two episodes later, we get another encounter with Amity, where she continues the sour first impression we got of her before. She picks on Luz pretty much unprovoked, destroys King's Cupcake, and once Luz challenges her to a witch's duel, she binds her to an everlasting oath that she has to quit magic if she loses. That's probably fine. All in all, not doing much to show she isn't a massive bi- Huh? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Uh... Massive meanie pants. Yeah. It's surprising then to see her more vulnerable side later on in the very same episode, where it's revealed her mentor was amping up her magic through the use of a glyph, and Amity being genuinely appalled and embarrassed by it. She talks about how she's been working all her life to even have a chance at joining the most prestigious coven on the Boiling Isles, the Emperor's Coven, and loses mere presence nearly throwing that away in the course of one hour. And my god, Mae Whitman's performance here is just so heckin' good. I have been working my whole life to get to the top! You lost! You cheated! Say it! Say you're not a witch! Ah, that vulnerability, dude. Good stuff. It's only when Luz relates to her on how hard she has to work as a human learning magic that Amity lightens up. Lightens up? I just got that. And unbinds the oath she put on her. It doesn't completely make up for her behavior in the last two episodes, but it's more than a lot of other bullies in animated shows tend to get. If you'll allow another brief comparison to Gravity Falls, the character of Pacifica Northwest is one of the most aggravating throughout the show's first season. Don't get me wrong, I love Gravity Falls, it's a great show, but there's still a lot of conventional tropes and arcs throughout its first season, and Pacifica being just another catty bully who was mean for seemingly no reason was definitely one of them. There was always a certain level of self-awareness in how shallow she was, but it wasn't enough to say anything new about the archetypal bully character. It would take until season 2 for the show to flesh her out a little more, even making her friends with the main characters and analyzing why she used her wealth and status against other people. Better late than never, I suppose, but Amity is very much if you took Pacifica's arc and knocked, knocked it in the 12th, 12th gear. Two episodes after the witch's duel incident, we meet Amity again and see the mask slip even further. Introducing her reading to a group of kids, having to fend off constant pestering from her older siblings, and get a genuine sense of self-reflection after she catches Luz accidentally snooping through her diary. I've been trying to figure out what your deal is. Are you a poser? A nerd? I know. You're a bully, Luz. The first time I heard that line, my immediate reaction was, Hey, pot, meat, kettle. But I think there was a very deliberate reason for Amity to call Luz a bully. Something that becomes much more apparent as she and Lou start to get to know each other better, and we learn that Willow and Amity were actually friends when they were kids. What? In a later episode, an incident at school renders Willow a complete amnesiac, forcing Luz and Amity to go inside her head and correct the ruined memories. Memories that Amity is very familiar with, though one in particular she's keen to avoid. When she's forced to confront this memory by Willow's inner self, we learn that Amity forced Willow away due to being coerced by her parents into associating with a more suitable class of witchling. 
Yeah, they do the thing where they call the younger version of something a ling. I never really minded that in fiction, but it just sounds weird when you say it. It's obvious Amity didn't want to give up her friendship with Willow, but her parents threatening Willow's future shook Amity a great deal, and God knows what other methods of coercion they've used on her over the years. It raises a lot of questions about her behavior to others like Willow and even Luz in every prior appearance she's had on the show. All the walls she's had to put up to become the top student in her track, the constant belittling of other people's, especially Willow's, talent. It stems from how she's had to guard her emotions, lest she fall short of the pedigree her family apparently has on the Isles. This all leads back to the reason why Amity called Luz a bully, where she could only equate such an action to that of bullying because that's the kind of thing Amity's been doing for most of her life. Finding someone's weakest qualities that even they don't like about themselves and exploiting them for her own benefit. She doesn't understand how Luz could have just made a mistake or how she never even wanted to find her diary because that's not what Amity would do. Luz making an honest effort to reach out to her at the end of the episode by sharing in her own fandom with the girl who'd been nothing but hostile toward her is the turning point in Amity going from just the bully to someone much deeper. Maybe you aren't a bully. I haven't exactly been the friendliest witch either. I'll think on that. It was a genuine surprise and play on my own expectations, seeing how much Amity's dynamic with Luz changed this early into the show's run. They start a book club, they high-five each other at school, they- So you two go to the same school now. Uh, that doesn't change anything. <sighs> huh? Wait a minute. Aha! J'accuse! The Freeze. Let's take a moment to congratulate Disney on the many firsts they've had in terms of LGBTQ representation. There was their first gay live-action character in the remake of Beauty and the Beast. There, did you see him? That less than five second interaction that could easily be taken as a joke? Good job, Disney! How about that supposed lesbian couple in Finding Dory that got all those soccer moms mad? The one that was never officially confirmed or denied by Disney and Pixar? Yeah, these two who could easily be friends or sisters or random strangers who just happened to have met that day. Good job, Disney. Their first gay character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I'm seeing them again tomorrow, so... See? He mentioned going out with a guy. We don't get to see that happening at all, and it's so understated I missed it two out of three times I saw this movie in theaters, but... He said him! Good job, Disney. How about that lesbian kiss in the last Star Wars movie? Pfft, last. The one that was so easy to edit out several overseas countries did? Or the lesbian cop in Onward that mentions having a girlfriend that was dubbed over in Russia? Good job! Good job! Very good! In all seriousness, I don't want to discredit the sincere attempts those working under Disney have done to try and include queer representation in their movies or shows. Even other shows like She-Ra or Steven Universe that seem to exude gay vibes didn't get to include these themes and characters without a fight. Of course, Disney being the major conglomerate that it is, could probably afford to take a hit from certain countries and domestic areas in a more authentic attempt at LGBTQ inclusion, but they seem to be dragging their feet on every occasion. This certainly hasn't stopped queer inclusion from happening on the Disney Channel before, though. With shows like Andy Mack, Good Luck Charlie, and even Doc McStuffins explicitly featuring gay or lesbian characters. Star vs. the Forces of Evil actually managed to slip in a gay couple kissing in the background of one of its episodes too, which was probably the extent Disney television animation was willing to go at the time. Even on Gravity Falls, creator Alex Hirsch, who voices King and Hootie in The Owl House, wanted to include an elderly lesbian couple in one episode that he was forced to change to a heterosexual one when the content was deemed inappropriate. So to say there's no effort on the people working at Disney's part to include more queer representation in their shows or movies would be entirely untrue. But even for the huge steps we've taken in terms of representation over the years, the pushback is still happening. And Disney, as a conglomerate, has shown that it cares more about mass profits than basic human rights. All that said made scenes like this the most subversive of all my expectations for this show. What about you, Amity? Me? On a team with you? <laughs> Running around in cute uniforms? <laughs> Sweating? I gotta go!
It's interesting in this day and age to have a somewhat open window with the creators of current popular shows. Nearly every major showrunner on TV has an account on social media websites like Twitter or Instagram, and Dana Terrace is no exception. On Twitter in particular, she posts many a sketch or drawing either related to Owl House or an original piece, and will sometimes answer questions people have about the show, such as whether or not there's any heterosexual reason for this intimate physical contact between Amity and Luz in the school dance episode. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! Everybody stay calm. Everyone. While I knew someone like Dana wouldn't intentionally queerbait her audience, I was still pretty skeptical that Disney would allow anything resembling an actual queer relationship between two major characters in one of their shows. Sure, they'd already had hints that Luz was bisexual before, and Willow is revealed to have two dads in the aforementioned memory-fixing episode, but it was one thing to have minor or subtly hinted representation and to explicitly show same-sex attraction. With the show's main character, no less. Lo and behold, enchanting Gromfright. Which has Luz bravely taking Amity's place in facing the terrible creature Gromethius, a demon that reveals a person's worst fears. Amity just so happens to be struggling with a certain note she's been holding on to most of the episode, and when she steps in to help Luz face her own fears, it becomes apparent, at least to us, what she's afraid of. <gasps> you were afraid of getting rejected! Amity, it's okay. What if I went to Grom with you instead? Really? That's what friends do. What follows is what I can only describe as one of the best animated sequences on any Disney Channel show. In fact, let's take a moment and appreciate some of this fluid animation, shall we? I mean, look at that hair and the, the bouncy, the wind and the... the look at... You know, the, the, well, look, they didn't have to do... Look at the detail... Look at this! Look at this guy! Look at his tentacle arms! And he, he's whooshing! This is all from episode one, by the way. Look at- Oh my god! Look at the, the, the jumping! And the- Ooh, the, the twirl here! Look at that! Oh my god! <laughs> this is just- The, the running- The running- uh, the, uh, I don't know animation terms. Like, follow through, I guess? Oh my god. Uh, look at this! Look at this! Look, look at the little- King doing the swingy swing! And, look at that! Oh, look at that. Oh my god, this episode is so... Oh, oh, the owls and the, the circles and the... And the more circles and the spinning and the whoosh and the... Ooh. Oh my... Oh my god, this episode... Oh, look. Oh my god. What, how can, Oh my god, animation is good! Anyway, back to the game. If there was still doubt in my mind that this show was really gonna go there, it ended with this dance. Not only is it just absolutely beautiful to look at, it's the culmination of Luz and Amity's relationship thus far, with the two in complete harmony, trusting each other and each taking the lead with their own respective forms of magic. The tree blossoming out of Grom being the perfect symbolism for the future of their potential relationship. Oh yeah, and there's this. So, who did you want to ask out? Oh, it's... it's not important. <laughs> Holy goddamn shit, Owl Crew! Children are still watching this- Yeah, I know, just let me have this. Dana Terrace took to Twitter not long after the episode dropped to talk about her own struggles and forwardness in wanting to include queer main characters in the show, confirming without shadow of a doubt that Luz is bisexual. Incidentally, the day I started writing this video script, she went on Reddit for an AMA where she confirmed Amity was a lesbian. Talk about good timing. The next episode would double down on Amity's crush on Luz where the poor girl gets flustered even thinking about her. She can be so stupid, which I love. I mean, hate! In any case, she needs you right now, which is sweet. I mean, I hate it, and it's dumb! You lost me. There's inevitably gonna be somebody who says, Who cares if a character is gay? Or, I wish they'd stop shoving this gay stuff in our faces. But you won't see any comments like that below, because I'm gonna delete them. <laughs> And look, I think all of us can agree that being queer shouldn't be a character's entire personality trait, which is clearly not the case for Amity and Luz. They've had 16 episodes prior to this to establish who they are and what they like and dislike independent of each other. This only makes their progression from being rivals to friends and Amity's apathy turning to a full-on gay panic crush even more significant. 
Dana Terrace has said that as of now, she has the full support of the current leadership of Disney TV, and even went out of her way to call out noted clickbait cesspool Cartoon Brew when they twisted her words for a headline. I know it's tempting to drag Disney at every opportunity, and it's nearly always well-deserved. Go off, King. But at the moment, at least one of their subsidiaries has allowed actual queer representation on one of their most major platforms, and they deserve some credit for that. There's still leagues behind some of their competitors in this regard, but we have to keep being vocal that we like seeing more LGBTQ characters and support shows that push for more meaningful inclusion. I don't know if Disney will chicken out in the future in regards to Lumity or any other queer rep, but for now, I'm cautiously optimistic. Maybe I just have rose-tinted goggles for how soft this ship is, but whatever, let me stand just once. I think I hurt my leg, but I'll be okay. Are you sure? I could help carry you if it really hurts. <laughs> I'm fine! <laughs> Who's Amity? And scoop! <laughs> oh, wow. Sports. Um... I don't really have a good segue plan for this next part, so let me just, uh... Um... Yeah. There we go. As was once put so eloquently by a philosopher whose name is now, alas, lost to us, you can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose- wait by a philosopher whose name is now alas lost to us. You can pick your friends, but you can't choose your family. I've seen this phrase interpreted a number of ways, depending on who's saying it. Speaking anecdotally, I remember one time I overheard a conversation a woman was having with her child about the importance of family. How you may have a strong bond with a friend or two, but someone like your sibling is always going to be there in your life, and you should appreciate that before it's too late. A nice sentiment, one I'm inclined to agree with given my good relationship with my own siblings, but some people aren't as lucky to have that good relationship with their family. To many, the aforementioned phrase about how you can't choose family is more of a cold fact than a reassurance. And this is where the prevalence of found families in fiction comes to play. It's not uncommon for teens or young adults to refer to their friends as family especially if they've had strong bonds with their friends ever since they were young. And already Luz's relationship with her close circle of comrades is in line with this found family trope. Sure, Luz's mom is waiting for her back home, and they love each other a lot, but it doesn't take long for Luz to fully ingratiate herself to Ida, who, on multiple occasions throughout the show, even as early as episode 3, will refer to Luz as her kid. Now what's the fun in watching a kid get eaten by a monster if it's my kid? This eventually extends to Gus and Willow, too, the more time they spend with Luz. Not a single one of those dumb kids have gotten hurt yet. Dumb kids? Wait. Those are my dumb kids! While Luz already has that strong familial bond, and from the little we see of Willow and Gus's parents, we can infer they have decent home lives too. It's really Ida and King who find a new sense of family in their relationships with Luz and her friends. In King's case, he's the sort of person, demon, cubone thing, who wants to be the center of attention. He wants people to fawn over him wherever he goes, offer him gifts, the whole shebang. He especially comes to value Luz's attention, even if it's mostly cuddles. This puts him in several situations where he doesn't want to share Luz's attention with anyone, be they her magic studies with Ida or time spent with Willow and Gus. But he also lets his ego get in the way of their friendship sometimes too, and he has to learn to not only value Luz's independence and that she can't spend all her time with him, but also to put other people's feelings before his. Luce, you're living your dream. You're becoming a witch. But this celebrity is as close as I'll ever get to my dream. It all went to my head, and I hurt you. I'm sorry. Hey, being with you is one of my favorite parts of this dream. Oh, stop! Ida has a gradual change the more she gets to know Luz, too. And it's in the same vein as King's character development. As Luz starts to get too impatient learning new spells, she starts to seek out alternate methods from learning at Hexide, a place Ida has nothing but foul memories from. No! Why? School! However, as Ida starts to think about what's best for Luz and how she doesn't really have the patience to teach as much as she should, she puts aside her own negative feelings about the school system that failed her and enrolls Luz for the next semester. It's a nice gesture from Ida, especially since she has to do a lot of hard work to get back into Principal Bump's good graces. But it shows how much Luz has rubbed off on her to the point where she seems to really think of Luz, King, and even Hootie as her family. We don't know much about how Ida and King behaved before Luz came to live with them, but I'm not sure they would have considered themselves a family. 
Just a couple of roommates and weirdos who benefit from staying together. But, as he'd have said in episode 1, Us weirdos have to stick together, you know? This is why Luz and her band of weirdos all fit together so neatly in the Owl House, and why she tends to bring the best out of everybody. Even Amity, who in one of her diary entries says, I wish I had somewhere to go. Find some solace with these weirdos she was quick to brush off just a few episodes ago. Still, there are those who adamantly believe that blood family will always take precedence over all other relationships. Blood is thicker than water, as they say. And this is where some of the conflict in the show comes from, even in the most healthy familial relationship we've seen so far. The lead into the inciting incident of the show is Luz being forced by her mom to attend a summer camp meant to reel in her overactive mind and fantasy interests. Their relationship may not be dysfunctional or strained to an uncomfortable degree, but there is a clear disconnect between them that Luz has to struggle with. As far as Miss Nacetta knows, her daughter is in summer camp, and Luz hates lying to her so much she can't even respond to her mom's texts beyond simple emojis. But at the same time, she doesn't want to give up learning magic and go back home either. Not until summer ends, anyway. It's not as thoroughly explored as it probably should be, but even with the loving relationship Luz has with her mom, the secrets she's keeping and the way her mom wants to quell her interests, even if it's with the best intentions, is a rising conflict that's just waiting to boil over. This is further emphasized in the first episode where Luz takes pity on some of the prisoners in the Boiling Isles Conformatorium for expressing their interests in the same things Luz does. I'm here because I like eating my own eyes. Oh. Oh. Well, mainly the lady who likes to write fanfic anyway. Her rebelling against the system and declaring no one should be locked away for what they like and who they are is definitely her own way of protesting the idea of going to that boring summer camp, and no matter how much she loves her, it remains to be seen if Luz will have some lingering resentment towards her mom the next time they meet. I mentioned them already, but Amity's parents deserve another look for how it was their insistence that she stop hanging out with Willow that made her who she was today. Sure, she's not completely irresponsible for her own actions, but a lot of the way a kid reacts to the world around them is informed by the teachings that their parents or guardians give them, intentionally or not. The smug elitism Amity displayed in her first couple appearances is a direct result of her parents telling her that the Blights are selective of who they associate with, even if those people are terrible to everyone else. Because to them, it's not about actually liking the company you keep. It's, it's all, all about, about presence! It's unfortunate how many bad or toxic behaviors a child can inherit from their parents, and it's never an easy thing to unlearn those behaviors overnight. Something the Owl House has demonstrated in Amity's slow turn from bully to friend of Luz and her gang throughout the first season. But the biggest source of familial consternation in the show comes from Ida's relationship to this lady, Lilith, the head of the Emperor's Coven and Ida's older sister. As it goes in some sibling relationships, when they were younger the two were thick as thieves, only to grow apart when Ida became a literal thief and Lilith a glorified cop in all but name. The first time we meet Lilith is in the convention episode. I don't know if I emphasized the pun before, the show is dumb and it gets me. Where we learn a little more about the coven system, and how to join one is to block yourself from the other sources of magic. Unless you're deemed good enough to join the Emperor's Coven, which can practice all forms of magic. Isn't that convenient. Ida has more than vocally expressed her disdain for this system in the past, and it's the reason she's forced to sell human junk to make a living while constantly evading the law including her own sister, who is one of the most militant upholders of the system, being the Emperor of the Isles number two. Their clashing personalities and ideologies regarding the Coven system put them at odds with each other nearly every time they meet. Sure, there's still some want they both have in bearing whatever hatchet is between them, but Ida's stubborn refusal to bind herself to a single Coven, and Lilith's task of bringing her in always quashes any chance of reconciliation. And while the Elder Clawthorn sibling may drag her feet in bringing in her sister, she's still ultimately willing to do so because... her boss told her to. Win this one because I told you to! Because you told me to! It's a little more complicated than all that, and to fully explain it would be going into heavy spoilers. But the fractured dynamic of the two sisters is the backbone of the conflict that arises near the end of Season 1. And it's here where a lot of people might be disappointed at how it turns out. Without being too specific or straying away from the positive vibes I'm trying to go for in this video, there's a common trend in shows geared towards kids where family differences tend to get resolved more on the forgiveness side, and the same is sort of true here. I wouldn't say Lilith's arc in the final episodes of Season 1 is bad. 
just a little rushed and may unintentionally perpetuate the idea that you should always forgive family no matter what they do to you or others. And that's a conflicting message. I give the Owl crew more credit than that, and trust the rift between Lilith and the other characters, especially Ida, will still be there somewhat. But we still have to wait and see what they do when Season 2 comes around. Dana Terrace has already hinted at exploring a lot more of the relationship between the two sisters, and even delving more into the Blight parents. I just hope everything about them isn't resolved in a neat, tidy bow in the traditional Disney sense. I mentioned the phrase, blood is thicker than water before, which is the most common phrase those who emphasize family over every other type of bond use. But there's a longer version that says, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Which, on top of sounding like the tagline for Bloodborne 2, was most likely originated to explain the bond soldiers made on the battlefield. A family born from adversity. It doesn't have to be applied to just the battlefield, though. It extends to whomever we choose to trust more than even our family. The strongest ties of friendship we can make. Weirdos sticking together. I'm hoping that the show doesn't lose sight of this, but again, we'll just have to see. One thing I'm not worried about, though, is the continued representation of an inherently broken and corrupt system of government. One that I might dare call... Fascist. I beg your pardon? System of government characterized by extreme dictatorship. Seven across. Oh, I see. It's uh, fascism. Fascism. Wonderful. Oh yeah, strap yourself in. We're going there. You remember that scene in an American tale where Fievel is wandering the streets of New York and looks into a classroom where they're reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? If you were like me, an American student who also recited the pledge every morning when school started, you probably didn't think much of this scene. You probably didn't think much of reciting the pledge every morning either. It was a thing you did so much for so long, it lost all meaning or significance people wanted it to have by the time you were... 12. But then you got older, and you started to realize that most fellow democratic governments don't have a pledge of allegiance that kids are expected, and sometimes forced, to recite every morning. You learn a little more about the history of the pledge and the various revisions and lines added over the years. And then you learn that not only was the Pledge of Allegiance not around when an American tale takes place, but that Under God was added nearly 70 years ago in the midst of the communist scare of the 1950s, and that the creator of the pledge himself said that one should recite it while saluting to the flag... like this. I'm not trying to pull some leftist gotcha on an American tale or anything. How could you, Fievel? I trusted you! But the scene is a pretty good example of revisionist history in action, even if the intent is relatively harmless. If you want a little more perspective on revisionist history and how it applies to a film like an American tale, I recommend watching the beginning of Dan Olson's video on the American tale video game. Stick around for the whole thing too, you won't be sorry. In the case of The Owl House, though, the series runs on the idea of revisionist history and propaganda much more than you might think at first glance. Bruce! As season one progresses and bits of the Boiling Isle's history is revealed, we start to learn a little more about the origins of the Coven system, and of the eponymous Emperor Bellos who presides over all of them. The way institutions like Hexide work, you might think that the system has been in place for centuries, but the truth is the Covens have only been around for 50 years, beginning when the Emperor took over and told the Witches of the Isles that they were practicing magic all wrong. The thing about the Witches' society on the Isles is that it was built on the literal bones of a titan whose magic was apparently so powerful, even in death, that all life evolved to wield it. According to an unauthorized history of the Isles, Gee, I wonder why it's unauthorized. Emperor Bellows ascended to power by claiming he could speak to the Titan itself, and that it was displeased with how they were using its magic wildly back in what is referred to by the Emperor's Coven as the Savage Ages. Thus, he created the Coven system, saying that only he and a select few of his personal Coven had the right to practice all forms of magic, and that this was the will of the Titan. Let's play! Whether or not Belos actually can talk to the Titan hasn't been confirmed yet, but his mysterious past and authoritarian form of government are... 
We can't warn anyone from making a tragic mistake without a red flag! The same unauthorized history mentions that before he came to the throne, he was an advocate for unification, using the claim that only he could interpret the Titan's will to convince others to follow him. Big red flag! It may seem hard to believe that so many would go along with this form of constricting government. Especially when those who don't join a coven are deemed wild witches and are routinely rounded up and punished severely. And especially when it's so relatively new in the entire history of the Isles. But again, how old is the Under God line in the Pledge of Allegiance? How many of us just assumed it was always a thing we said before school started? I know I certainly did. This along with the line in the book that states the Savage Ages were so chaotic that people accepted this strict government with open arms, paints a lot of parallels to how fascist regimes tend to rise from the seemingly most mundane and sincere places. A fascist is never going to outright say that they want the power and the ability to dictate how others live. They will always frame it under the banner of unity, wanting to restore order to a chaotic world, to make the Boiling Isles great again. And look, I realize it's become a bit blasé to call every antagonist in a children's cartoon a fascist, but the system Bellos created in bringing everyone out of the Savage Age bears more than a few similarities to fascist ideologies. More specifically, palingenetic ultranationalism, a term coined by political theorist Roger Griffin. In his own words, palingenetic refers to the myth of rebirth or regeneration. Fascism thus emerges when populist ultranationalism combines with the myth of a radical crusade against decadence and for renewal in every sphere of national life. The result is an ideology which operates as a mythic force celebrating the unity and sovereignty of the whole people. He clarifies also that this unity is anti-liberal, anti-Marxist, and anti-conservative. For even when the mythic values of the nation's history or prehistory are celebrated, the stress is on living out eternal values in a new society. The hallmark of the fascist mentality is the sense of living at the watershed between two ages, and of being engaged in the front line of the battle to overcome degeneration through the creation of a rejuvenated national community, an event presaged by the appearance of a new man embodying the qualities of the redeemed nation. Again, without dipping too much into spoilers, in the final two episodes of the season, Bellos alludes to something called the Day of Unity, and it's obvious from the watered-down tour he has his assistant give to the students of Hexide that he's presenting a very biased depiction of himself as the savior of the Isles from the decadent Savage Age. The harsh punishment of those who refuse to join a coven, as well as those who are put into the conformatorium for not fitting in with the rest of society, demonstrates the desire Bellos has to move away from the decadence of the olden days, hyping himself as the new man through his supposed communication with the Titan. The ultranationalism part of the society is best shown in how many of the more elite class on the Isles see Luz. Initially, Amity dismisses Luz's efforts as a human to learn magic, saying that her just being at the convention gives witches a bad name, even telling her to admit she's not a witch after the duel fiasco. She, along with her posse of cool girls, also spend a lot of time picking on Willow for being supposedly weaker than them, perpetuating the fascist belief of the weak link holding back the whole chain of the society. But I think the best example actually comes from pretty late in the season when someone tells Luz, Go back to your world. This one is ours. I don't think I've ever seen a Disney show lean in so hard on these fascist themes before, showing the revised history the government is trying to present, where their leader is this shining savior who has come to liberate them from their degenerate past. And to be fair, I think maybe Starverse has tackled some of these themes too, but like I said before, I didn't watch much past the first episode. It's great that kids can watch this show and others like it and learn to question authority to not take the history they're given at face value, to question the intent of the ruling class and whether they really have their best interests at heart, and when to recognize a fascist movement when they see it. All that said, and I'm just getting this out of the way in case it happens, Dana Terrace is not a fascist sympathizer if Belos is either redeemed or given a tragic backstory. One look at her Twitter for the politics she believes in or the positive themes of this show could tell you that but this apparently needs to be said of certain creators nowadays whenever this happens. At this point, I'm not sure if Bellows should be redeemed, but that's only because we know so little about him. In theory, I believe anyone can come around on their crap worldviews. I mean, look at Amity. 
but there's a lot of nuance on the topic of redemption that a lot of people fail to grasp, and that's my hot take. Alright, now that I've probably stirred the pot one too many times, let's get into some lighter territory. I'm gonna bounce around the other things I like about this show in no particular order, so to have a semblance of organization, I'll add this sound effect whenever I switch thoughts. Okay, here we go. I like that Hexide is portrayed as a pretty realistic school, one that puts more of an emphasis on training kids to join the workforce rather than support their individual growth. When Luz officially enrolls, she expresses a desire to study all the tracks, but is put into one by the principal as per the Emperor's regulations. She finds like-minded peers who wanted to study multi-tracks too, and were punished for it. And I think that's a great commentary on the American school system putting more emphasis on practicality than actually encouraging students to learn. This is also the reason why Willow's dads probably put her in the Abomination track originally. I'm just speculating, but I think maybe those who study Abominations are seen as more useful than those who study plants. Bump himself is portrayed as a fairly reasonable guy, allowing Luz to enroll and for her and Ida to have protection from the Emperor's Coven while she studies there. He even relents on every student having to restrict themselves to one track, so he obviously cares a little about his students engaging with their interests. Although, he and the other teachers are more than willing to look the other way at some of the more popular students' antics. We should have just kept a low profile. Basha could get away with murder if she wanted to. What's this? Basha got away with murder? I can't say I approve, but at least she's trying new things. I talked a great deal about the queer representation on this show, so it's only right I mention the racial diversity as well. Obviously, you have Luz and her mom, Dominican-American women who regularly slip from English to Spanish, and it's a great detail that adds a lot of authenticity to Luz's character. I especially like how none of it has subtitles. You can just gauge what they're saying through the context of how they're saying it. The witches on the Boiling Isles have varying skin tones, and I'd have to do a more focused study to see how many Caucasian-appearing characters appear in favor of people of color, but the most prominent characters outside of Luz are Willow and Gus, and Willow's last name being Park could mean she is meant to be Korean-coded. There's a bit of a gray area in all this, since the witches of the Isles don't seem to be categorized by race in the same way that people are in the real world. But all that said, the show is definitely going for a more inclusive angle, and that's always nice. The design of this show is freaking fantastic. Dana Terrace says her main inspiration was from the art of Remedios Varo, John Bauer, and Hieronymus Bosch, and I absolutely adore every location and character design we've seen so far. Alex Hirsch's comedic timing and heart that he put into the performances of the characters he played in Gravity Falls is as top form in this show as it was there. This shall suffice. With King, he has a lot of little grunts and squeaks that emphasize what a little gremlin this guy is. And it is so heckin' cute how quickly he and Luz become buddies. Good morning, you little cutie pie. I am not your cutie pie! Yes, you are. <sighs> I know. He also plays Hootie, the bird tube thing that resides over the owl house, and I gotta be honest, there's some weird part of me that loves annoying voice humor, so I never get tired of Hootie and how everybody seems to dislike him to some degree. You wanna hear my worst nightmare? I hadn't heard or seen much of Wendy Malick in a while before this show was announced. She's always had a distinct voice that manages to fit well with any character she's playing be they the affectionate femme fatale parody of Beautiful Gorgeous, or the tender if somewhat abrasive Chica from Emperor's New Groove. That kind of behavior just, just, uh, I gotta go wash something. So I was pretty glad to see her in a prominent role on a TV show. She's had pretty steady work up until now, but I don't watch regular TV. Come on, cartoons are better. In fact, I have written a heartfelt sonnet to commemorate this occasion. Whoops, a gust of wind just got me. See you after school. Bye! Sarah Nicole Robles seems like a relative newcomer as a voice actress, but she's been knocking it out of the park so far. Her performance as Luz is, for want of a better word, genuine. There's never really a part of me that thinks about how she's not really a teenager or this is just someone acting. I only ever think of Luz when I watch each episode. And my god, does she go to some emotional places in the later episodes of season one. Which should I wear to Grom? This one says, Witch with a Dark Side. But this one says, I'm an otter, with a dark side. Mae Whitman is always a treat in anything she's in. Her? 
but for some reason I had a hard time associating the voice she uses for Amity with some of her other famous characters like Katara or Yuffie. Maybe her voice has changed somewhat over the years, or I'm just weird. I don't know, it's not a bad thing by any means, it's just something I noticed. I never played again after that day. Ah! Ah, sorry, I just really love backstories. I gotta stop before I just list off every voice actor on this show. I mean, geez, everyone is so good. Voice actors deserve a lot more praise for what they do. Okay, just one more. Matthew Reese as Emperor Bellos is... Mwah, chef's kiss. The only other voice work he's done so far has been for Cartoon Network's Infinity Train. For an equally chilling bit role, but hot dang if he isn't even creepier here. Just a moment, Lilith. Ah, that's better. Oh yeah, and hearing Aaron Hansen from Game Grumps every so often is nice too. Put down a tarp, I'm gonna puke! <laughs> Witches can carve their own familiars out of tree bark called palismans. Ida named her as Albert, and he's the cutest f***ing thing I've ever seen. Aw, oh, what a sweetie. There's an episode where Luz challenges the popular girl Basha to a sport called Grudgeby. That's like an even rowdier version of rugby. And the B-plot is Ida challenging Lilith to a game, too. If Lilith wins, Ida has to surrender herself to the Emperor. Earlier, Ida mentioned being on the Grudgeby team at Hexside and being the star player through the use of cheats. I thought that the show was gonna go down the path where Luz cheats to win and she gets called out for it and we learn how cheating isn't cool and everything we've heard before. But it doesn't go down that road. Even Ida doesn't get the chance to cheat. It's really refreshing to not have that kind of moral in an episode like this and just focus on the sport. And Amity going into complete gay panic mode throughout the whole thing is fun, too. Amity! Oh, Luz! You're here! I mean, obviously you're here, this is school, and you go here now. With, uh, me. I've been talking for too long. Speaking of Basha... In contrast to Amity's interesting character development, you have Basha, who remains an elitist jerk every time we see her in Season 1. I know I went off before about characters who are mean seemingly just for the sake of it, but I actually like that Basha isn't redeemed just yet, if she even ever will be. I don't know if you know this, but certain teenagers can be the absolute worst. I'm speaking from experience, I used to be one of those teens who thought he was better than everyone else for arbitrary reasons. You were a theater kid, 16-year-old me, who did you think you were fooling? So while I'm grateful Amity wasn't stuck in the rival character slot for most of Season 1, it's still realistic that there'd be at least one jerk character who uses their status to bully others. So I like that she's still a minor source of conflict. Your pride has destroyed you. There she goes, Captain of the Banshees, off to win another championship for Hexide. Why can't you be more like her? <laughs> Bye! Good luck, Miss Amity. Thank you. Thank you, Braxis. See you next time. <sighs> Alright, I think this video's long enough. It's entirely possible I'm just a little too invested in a show revolving around characters I'm at least a decade older than. More than a decade for some characters. Oh god. Oh god! I remember when I was a kid, I used to think there'd come a day when I would give up watching cartoons. Replaced with all the variety that live-action TV has to offer. Like situational comedies, police procedurals, and... Boomer humor. Finish this lyric. Okay. The love boat. Sails away. <laughs> ha! It wasn't so much a worry as it was a solemn resignation that one day I'd probably stop watching cartoons since it was just an accepted fact that adults didn't watch them after they'd grown up. That they'd aged out of such childish things and moved on to be cogs in the ever-growing machine of capitalism. Even when I was still a teen, I found myself drifting away from Disney Channel and hardly watching many of the new shows on Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. This was also that period where I was a cynical jerk who thought way too highly of himself, so it seemed all but kismet that I'd abandon watching cartoons sooner rather than later.
But then something happened. The cartoons that were coming out were good. Really good, actually. They managed to speak to that weird sense of humor so many late millennials and early Gen Zers had thanks to growing up with the internet. Shows like Adventure Time, Regular Show, Gravity Falls, Steven Universe. The pipeline of creative and character-driven cartoons didn't seem to stop. Hell, even My Little Pony, of all things, managed to break out into a wider, if somewhat weirder, following thanks to the amount of care the crew put into the, even the simplest of episodes. What was happening here? Why was I still so drawn to cartoons when I was getting ready to graduate from high school? When I was well into college? When I've moved to another country and gotten married? It took me a while to figure it out, but I think the answer to why so many of these cartoons were resonating with me and a lot of people my age was relatively simple. The kids who had grown up with a deep love of animation had grown up themselves, and now they were in charge. It's not like everyone in the animation industry pre-2010 was a soulless robot only interested in churning out a profit. But the shift to more overarching stories and character-driven narratives has to have been inspired by the kind of stories that resonated with these creators when they were kids. I mean, look at all the anime influence in shows like Steven Universe or She-Ra. The people in charge of these cartoons are just as nerdy as we are, and that's fantastic! Every so often you get the galaxy brain take that says all these new shows look exactly the same, or that somehow not adhering to how things were back in the good old days makes something automatically inferior. And then there's crap like this meme I saw on Facebook that equates all current animation to... Big Mouth. Like, what? To these people I can't help but feel incredibly sorry for. Animation is absolutely limitless in how it can tell its story how it presents a tone to its audience. Comedy, horror, action, drama, romance, or any combination therein. For every great live-action show, I can think of at least five more animated ones that I never get tired of. Shows like The Owl House aren't any less engaging or worthy of serious critical discussion just because they're animated or for kids. These are the kind of shows that should be evaluated more because they're made with kids in mind to see what kind of messages it's trying to impart to the next generation. Messages of inclusivity, friendship, found families, questioning dubious authority, all told through spectacular visuals and enthusiastic storytelling from dozens upon hundreds of people who want to make the kind of shows they wish they could have seen when they were young. Sure, not everyone is going to like The Owl House. I think if you've never seen it and stuck around this long, you can gauge whether or not it's for you. But the fact that so many people outside the target demographic can resonate with some of the themes and characters in this show isn't a sign that we've regressed as a society or whatever. It's a sign that we need to stop overlooking shows like this just because they're designed for kids. After all, in the words of a fellow cartoon lover, you're dead if you aim only for kids. Adults are only kids grown up anyway. And yeah, I know Disney was a staunch capitalist who screwed over his own workers, but that's not a fun fact to end a video on. I notice how she looks at me, but I pretend that I don't see. It's easier if I let the tension subside. Wow, hey, you actually listened to me talk for over an hour. You have the patience of a saint, my friend. I just wanted to pop in and add a few things in addendum. First of which is... The Owl House is coming to Disney Plus October 30th, just in time for Halloween. So if you have Disney Plus and you haven't seen the show yet, that's definitely the time to watch it. But if you don't have Disney Plus, then just sign up for the free trial, watch the whole show, and quit. Also, if you happen to like this video and want to throw something my way, I don't have a Patreon because I'm still trying to figure out what I even want to do with this channel, but I set up a coffee page. Kofi? Coffee? Uh, whatever. I set up a channel on that side if you want to toss some loose change my way. Loose credit card or PayPal change. I'm pretty sure they don't take cash. But if you hated this video and want to throw something other than money at me, well, don't. But I also put a link for the Trevor Project in the description, so you can donate to that if you want to. It's a non-profit organization set up to help LGBTQ youth against suicide. Now more than ever, it's important to let queer kids know that we want them in this world and there's more love and tolerance than hate. And if you happen to know of any good charities that focus on trans people in particular, let me know and I'll add it to the description. A special thanks to my wife, Rebexorcist on YouTube, and at BexDK on Twitter. That's at B 
E-X-D-E-E-K-A-Y for helping me with some of the visual gags and thumbnail for this video. The photo I've got under the credits was actually something she made while I was working on this stupid thing. Go check her out, she's pretty neat. To those who have watched all of Season 1 already, I also wanted to list a few shows to fill the void while you wait for Season 2. On Netflix, there's Kipo and the Age of the Wonder Beasts, which is airing its third and final season, October 12th. It's a really fun take on the post-apocalypse, and each season is only 10 episodes, so it won't take long to catch up. There's also The Dragon Prince, which has aired three seasons so far and is set to air four more in the future. If you like Avatar The Last Airbender, you're definitely gonna like that one. On HBO Max, there's Infinity Train, which finished its third season around the same time season one of The Owl House ended, and it's up in the air whether or not they'll get another one, so please, please, please get the free trial and binge it if you haven't yet. It's an anthology series following various people as they navigate through a strange interdimensional train, and it tackles themes of loss, identity, and change. It's so good. Just please watch it. There's a couple other shows airing right now that I need to watch myself, like Amphibia on Disney Channel. And now that I'm finally done with this stupid video that took me literally all of September to make, I can actually start watching other things. So, that's what I'm gonna do. See ya. Credit where it's due, I think we're all forgetting who Disney's real first gay character is.